and uh, Alex is going to give the talk. This mic, yep, okay, we're good. Okay, so uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, this is work, joint work with Vlad Klesnikov, Hugo Kraftchik, Yehuda Lindell, and Tal Rabin. So let's consider the, the following scenario. Suppose we have some military base somewhere and it wants to establish a secure channel with an agent in the field and particularly with an agent in this green zone here. So uh, we have two agents, one in the red zone, one in the green zone. And their goal is to establish some secure channel with uh, the base, but they also want to keep their location hidden. So we can look at this more closely. So the base will have some policy P that specifies some set of latitudes and longitudes that specify this green zone. And these two um, agents will also have, uh, or will have a attribute vector specifying their latitude and longitude. Okay, and we want that the base can establish a secure channel with one of these agents if um, the policy is satisfied by these attributes. So um, abstracting out a bit, uh, the uh, base will have some policy P, the agents will have an attribute vector chi, and this policy is public, so they, both of the agents will know this policy and will view it going forward as a Boolean circuit. And these attributes, uh, will be private and we'll, we can view them as bit strings. So what are some possible solutions for this problem? Um, the most immediate one we could think of is to use attribute-based credentials. So this is a very uh, um, hot area. There's tools from Microsoft and IBM that uh, achieve attribute-based credentials. But the main goal here is not key exchange, it's identification or access control. And it's not immediately clear how we can bootstrap key exchange from this. Also, the current schemes can't handle very complicated policies, at least efficiently. Um, so in particular, they could um, almost exclusively handle uh, Boolean formulas rather than arbitrary circuits. Likewise, we can try to uh, construct this using attribute-based encryption. Here the idea is that uh, a party can decrypt some value if it satisfies the policy that that ciphertext was encrypted under. But again, uh, ABE doesn't work for complicated policies in terms of practically efficient constructions. So in this work, what we do is we introduce a notion that we call attribute-based key exchange. So again, the idea here is that uh, a server and client uh, can establish a secure channel if the client's attributes satisfy the server's policy. Um, our construction supports efficiently arbitrary policies, and by arbitrary, I mean uh, a polynomial size Boolean circuits. Um, and we also implement it and show an efficient construction and our construction uh, is based on garbled circuits from the 2PC literature. So just to give uh, some timings to demonstrate the efficiency. So we ran some experiments over uh, policies with 100,000 AND gates and 200 attributes. And we find that the server computation time is only 241 milliseconds and the client computation time is 81 milliseconds. So even for huge policies with a lot of attributes, uh, the running time is, is quite efficient. Okay, so let's uh, dig into this a bit more. So um, again, we'll have, uh, we'll denote this little castle as the server and this archer here as the client. And so the server holds a policy and the client holds uh, a set of attributes. Um, but we also need a certificate authority to assign these attributes to the clients. Most attribute-based, or I think all attribute-based constructions require some notion of a CA um, to assign attributes to clients. Um, and again, what we want is that uh, these two parties can derive a shared key uh, if and only if the attributes satisfy the policy. Um, we also want some additional uh, uh, privacy mechanisms. In particular, we want attribute privacy, so the uh, server should not be able to learn the client's attributes. 
We want unlinkability in the sense that the server should not be able to correlate two interactions with uh, any two clients. So it shouldn't be able to determine whether they're speaking with the same client or not. And finally, uh, important in all attribute-based uh, uh, schemes, we want some notion of collusion resistance in the sense that two clients with different attribute vectors shouldn't be able to combine them in some way to produce a new attribute vector that they don't individually have. Okay, so uh, uh, we'll define this now in the ideal models. So here we'll have some trusted party, and it will have a mapping of all the clients to their specific attribute vectors. So the way this is gonna work is that the server will send its policy to the trusted party. That, that party will forward it on to the client. Then if the client wants to, it can initiate an exchange. And now the trusted party will check if the client's attributes uh, satisfy the policy given by the server, and if so, it'll uh, uh, generate a random key K and give it to the two parties, and otherwise it'll send some error message or bot. Okay, and now let's see how this captures these notions that we want of attribute privacy, unlinkability, and collusion resistance. So it captures attribute privacy um, in the sense that the server never sees the attribute vector of the client. All it sees is the result of this, uh, of the key exchange. Um, unlinkability is handled by the fact that the client never uh, sends any identifying information to the server. And finally, collusion resistance uh, holds because this trusted third party maintains the mapping. So namely, um, the decision here isn't based on whatever um, attribute vector is given by the client because she can always just make a fake attribute vector, namely it's given by this mapping that is known by the trusted party. Okay, so how do we build attribute-based key exchange? Um, so we'll base our construction on a uh, protocol by Jorik, Kirschbaum, and Orlandi from CCS 2013 that achieves zero knowledge using garbled circuits. And we will take that protocol and combine it with a new primitive that we introduce called attribute selective encryption and that will give us um, our protocol. So I'll begin by describing this zero knowledge using garbled circuits protocol and then how we um, change it to get it to work for attribute based key exchange. And to do so, I have to discuss two building blocks, garbled circuits and oblivious transfer. So I'll briefly discuss those now. So uh, a garbled circuit is essentially a way of constructing a garbled version of some, of some function f in the sense that a party that evaluates this garbled circuit shouldn't be able to learn anything about any of the internal values when evaluating. So in particular, we'll view F as a Boolean circuit, and what we'll do is we'll assign uh, two wire labels to each wire. These are random values, and one wire label will denote the zero bit on that wire, and the other will denote the one bit. And the basic idea is now we can go through all of the gates in uh, the garbled circuit, and do an encryption procedure that will encrypt the appropriate output wire label using the appropriate input wire labels. And now when evaluating, uh, the evaluator will be able to decrypt, uh, will be able to work through the circuit and decrypt the appropriate output wire labels and then feed that into the next uh, gate. So uh, more formally, we can define some garbling procedure that takes some function and outputs a garbled circuit and a set of um, input wire labels to that circuit. Okay, uh, so uh, next I'll talk about what oblivious transfer is. So oblivious transfer is a two-party protocol between a sender and a receiver. The sender inputs two messages, M0, M1. The receiver inputs a bit B and gets his output M sub B. And the security notions here are that the sender should not be able to learn anything about the bit input by the receiver, and the receiver should not be able to learn anything about the other message. Okay, now let's take these uh, two primitives and combine them to construct a zero knowledge protocol. So suppose, uh, so we have a prover and a verifier, and suppose a verifier wants to confirm that the prover knows some value x such that f of x equals y. So uh, the verifier will begin by sending a garbled circuit of f prime, where f prime is essentially this check, does f of x equal y or not? They will then run an oblivious transfer protocol where the verifier will input the input wire labels to the garbled circuit. The prover will use the bits of its input X to select um, which wire labels it receives. 
And then it could evaluate the garbled circuit on those wire labels to get some output wire label. It then commits to this wire label, sends it to the verifier. The verifier then reveals all the randomness used to construct the garbled circuit because there's no check up here that the verifier indeed garbled the correct circuit. The prover will check that the garbling was indeed done correctly using this randomness. And if so, it'll decommit to this output wire label. And now the verifier can check if the output wire label corresponds to the one bit, and then it'll output one, and otherwise it'll output zero. Okay, so now let's take this protocol and adapt it to the attribute-based uh, key exchange setting. So we'll map the prover to the client and the verifier to the server. Um, they will both have uh, P, and the client will additionally have its attribute vector. Um, server, as before, will send a garbling of this policy. We'll then run some, we'll re then run attribute selective encryption, which for now we can view as a, a magic box that'll output the appropriate um, input wire labels uh, for the given attribute vector of the client. Now the client can evaluate the garbled circuit and proceed exactly as we did in the uh, zero knowledge protocol, namely commit to the wire label. The server will reveal the randomness of the garbled circuit. The client will check that the garbled circuit was done correctly and then decommit to the wire label. And now instead of the server outputting some value, um, it checks that this is indeed uh, the one bit. And if so, it uh, um, continues and then the parties uh, do coin tossing to derive a shared key. Okay, so the final step here is to dig into exactly what this attribute selective encryption procedure is. So we can view attribute selective encryption as, in some sense, a combination of attribute-based encryption and oblivious transfer. So it's similar to attribute-based encryption in the sense that uh, a party decrypts based on what its attribute vector is. And it's similar to oblivious transfer in the sense that the party will receive one of two messages based on its attribute vector. So in some sense, we can view it as this box where a party inputs, say, two M messages uh, the other party will input um, an m-bit attribute vector and receive the messages that correspond to uh, those attributes. Okay, so uh, in actuality, uh, ACE consists of five algorithms. We have uh, a gencert algorithm, uh, which given some master secret key and some attribute vector will produce a public key and secret key tied to that attribute vector, and this is where the CA comes in, so the CA would run this and then hand the public key and secret key to the client. We have a verify algorithm, which uh, verifies that the public key was indeed created by the CA. We have an unlink algorithm, which basically produces a randomized version of the public key and secret key, but still tied to the same attribute vector. And then we have our standard encrypt and decrypt, where encrypt will encrypt the set of two M messages, say, and output a ciphertext and decryption will take that ciphertext and as output produce the M messages that correspond to the attribute vector. Okay, so now how do we use this uh, notion in our protocol? So besides just having the attribute vector, the client will also have uh, the corresponding public key and secret key produced by the CA for this attribute vector. Um, as before, the server will send a garbling of the policy uh, the client will then run the unlink algorithm to produce an unlinked version or a randomized version of its public key and secret key tied to that same attribute vector. Send uh, this randomized public key to the server who will verify that it's indeed a valid public key. Now the server will encrypt uh, the input wire labels to the garbled circuit using this public key, send the ciphertext off to the client who will decrypt and get the uh, input wire labels associated with its attribute vector, and then we proceed as before, except this should be chi instead of x. Okay, so uh, thus far I've only given the syntax really for attribute selective encryption, but we also need some security properties to get this to work with um, um, our goals of attribute-based key exchange. Um, so in particular, we want really the same three security properties that we wanted in attribute-based key exchange, namely attribute privacy, collusion resistance, and unlinkability. So what do those mean in this setting? 
Attribute privacy essentially means that the public key should hide anything about the attributes that it's tied to. Um, collusion resistance means that two clients should not be able to produce a valid public key for some attribute vector that they don't have. And unlinkability says that uh, the server should not be able to link any um, two interactions with the same public key. Okay, so how do we construct attribute selective encryption? Well, in our paper, we show two constructions, one based on this new notion called extractable linearly homomorphic signatures, and another based on identity-based encryption. Uh, in this talk, I will just talk about this first one, and you can look at the paper for the second construction. So what is an extractable linearly homomorphic signature? It's essentially a standard cryptographic signature scheme with two additional properties, um, namely that the signatures are homomorphic in the sense that um, signature in M1, M2 equals the signature of M1 times the signature of M2. And there is some extractor property, which I'm not going to get into. So an example of such a scheme is a variant of the bonnet lynn um signature scheme. Uh, so the public key here is a group element H, and H raised to a random exponent X, and X comprises the secret key. Now, to sign a message, we just take m to the x, and that's our, our signature. And to verify, we uh, use bilinear maps to check that these two mappings are equivalent, namely um, map sigma on h and m of h to the x. And the only difference between this protocol and the original bonnet lynn shockham scheme is that in their scheme, they hash this message before applying these uh, procedures. In our paper, we prove that this is an ELH signature scheme under the knowledge of exponent assumption. Okay, now that we have that, let's build our attribute selective encryption scheme. So I'll run through the protocols uh, one by one, or the algorithms one by one. So we initially need to generate the public key and secret key for this attribute vector. So uh, for simplicity, let's assume that it's just one bit. So there's only one attribute. So uh, we'll generate a public key and a secret key. The public key will correspond to these green elements, and the secret key will correspond to these, uh, I guess, gray-looking elements. So the public key contains three group elements, G, H, and U, and another group element, E, which is either G to the R if uh, chi equals zero, and H to the R if chi equals one, where R is some random value that will comprise the secret key. And then we have appropriate signatures um, signed by the CA on um, these, these public key values. Okay, verification is straightforward. We just check that the signatures are indeed valid signatures. Um, unlinking is also relatively straightforward. We just take each of the public key elements and raise it to some random R prime, as well as the signatures. And because of our, the properties of the ELH signature scheme, um, these signatures will be uh, signatures on these modified elements. And we also take uh, our secret key and just multiply it by this R prime. Okay, to uh, encrypt, so we're trying to encrypt two messages, x0 and x1. So we generate uh, random exponent values s and t, and in the case of x0, we'll um, produce as our ciphertext g to the s and x0 times e to the s. And we'll do the same with x1, except use t and h. And then decryption uh, uh, is fairly straightforward. We will just uh, take our ciphertext component based on whether chi equals 0 or 1 and divide out the, the first element by the second element, raising the denominator by our secret key r. And why does this work? Well, suppose that chi equals 0, say then what we get here is x0 times e to the s divided by g to the sr. If chi equals zero, then e to the s is g to the r, so these will cancel and we'll get x0 back. Okay, so uh, we went ahead and implemented this. Um, so we implemented the uh, uh, ACE scheme that I just described uh, based directly from ELH signatures. Um, the code is open source um, if you'd like to experiment with it. And uh, we experimented with two um, uh, implementations, an unoptimized version and an optimized version where we moved a lot of the computation offline. So the garbling procedure uh, doesn't need to be run off online. We can move it to an offline stage. 
and where we do batch verification. So if the, if the, server, the server has to verify that the client's public key is, um, is valid, and uh, we imagine a scenario where the server will be having a lot of connections to a bunch of different clients, and in that case, we can batch a lot of these uh, verification steps together to get them to be more efficient. So for the performance um, of our unoptimized computation time, we measured along the x-axis the number of gates and as well as a uh, number of attributes. The y-axis is the uh, computation time in seconds. And in the most extreme case, for 100,000 AND gates and 200 attributes, we have a uh, server computation time of uh, 944 milliseconds and a uh, client computation time of 159 milliseconds. But when we take our optimized computation times, the server time basically drops by um, uh, four times, and the uh, client uh, drops by two, um, just by moving the computation offline and doing batch verification. OK, so to conclude, um, in this work, we introduced attribute-based key exchange. Um, and uh, demonstrated a construction of ABKE from attribute selective encryption um, and zero knowledge using garbled circuits. And uh, we showed how to construct attribute selective encryption uh, from extractable linearly homomorphic signatures and uh, demonstrated that uh, this is actually a practically efficient uh, uh, key exchange. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, for some questions. So the time is dominated by the garbling? It's not the OT operation for the... The time is not dominated by the garbling. It's, so the batch verification helps a lot. Um, and there's some other, there's some, uh, uh, Yeah. Uh, in the paper, we have a full break breakdown of the unoptimized and optimized and where the improvements come from. But garbling is very small. I think it's four milliseconds to do, so we don't save much by moving it offline. It's mostly the, the batch verification. And what were the policies you used there? Um, we just used uh, a garbled circuit with 100,000 AND gates. No, we didn't implement specific policies. We did run experiments with what the size would be for the GPS example we gave. Um, and it contained, I think, 60,000, I don't remember if it's 60,000 AND gates or just gates total, but in any case, it's much less than um, what we're doing here, and it was like 64 attributes when you view the latitude and longitude as 32-bit values. Um, yeah, so very, very nice work. It really shows that it hopefully can be practically for, even for complicated policies. So I, I want to ask, I don't think I've seen citations, so can you um, remind us what the closest related work is? Sorry? What, what is the closest related work to attribute-based uh, keys change? Uh, so it would probably be uh, attribute-based credentials or anonymous credentials. Well, that's a huge body of work, right? So, yes. Okay. But it's a, it's a slightly different setting, and uh, it's mostly identification and access control is the goals there. Okay. Um, and... Uh, the, uh, the constructions um, mostly just work for Boolean formulas rather than Boolean circuits. So as soon as you consider a 100,000 gate circuit, um, it seems... That, that's for your construction based on garbled circuits, but in terms of the definitions, they are quite comparable, right? Or... Um, so uh, they're... No, because the uh, um, attribute-based credentials, the, it, I, the output is just a bit whether you know, identification succeeded or not. Well, but I it's know, not. Okay, I think I know at least two works that also show how to combine anonymous credentials with keys change. So, but we can take it offline. Okay, yep. sure. One of them is from IBM, so <laughs> that's fine. Okay. I'm a little confused by the distinction you're drawing between formulas and circuits. So, uh, um, a Boolean formula cannot uh, uh, reuse internal wires, whereas, so if you take a, um, yeah, you'd have to basically have, there's an exponential blow up from going from an arbitrary circuit, or worst case, to a Boolean formula. 
Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again.